My mother says she has started to see things at the edge of her vision. Mice, flies, general disturbers of her immaculate and germ-free peace. She has always warned me against reading in the dark. She says, maybe I should get my eyes checked. My mother's breasts swing like twin pendulums, like scrying crystals, eggplants with huge pink areolas growing downwards. Getting dressed is a daily parade. She hates her body, but she loves her nakedness. My mother sits down next to me on the stairs. I avoided looking at her for so long. Is it true I haven't seen her face up close for years? Symmetrical hemispheres of high cheekbone, eyes rimmed red and glass, residue of the day's lipstick in lip crevices. It's true I haven't seen her body up close for years. Her hands have started to resemble my grandmother's slightly swollen bones and papyrus skin. My mother is a hypochondriac. She loves to regale all willing and unwilling listeners with tales of her cats and minor injuries. How an ungrateful teacup handle broke off and stamped her thumb. How an irresponsible door hit her on the bridge of her nose. My mother has moments of clarity. She apologizes for depriving me of daring things of all kinds. Skiing, camping, horseback riding. She apologizes and then forgets she has apologized for her boundless grief. My mother, has no, my mother has no idea how many poems I've written about her. <laughs> when she was drunk and angry, I used to write her letters so that I could express myself without her interrupting. She has always said, I'm not as good at words as you are. She also says, you got the creative gene from me. <laughs> Uh, so, as was said, I'm in from Czech Republic. I've been living there for three years. I went there to teach English, and I just loved it so much that I stayed. And I'm really lucky tonight to have some people here supporting me, including my Czech boyfriend, who's right here. <laughs> and it's his first time in New York City. Yeah! What's really, yeah. We, hope he'll, we hope he'll come back. And uh, what's really interesting is the simultaneous culture shock and reverse culture shock that we're both experiencing. <laughs> so I wrote this poem called Impressions. The girl who sells us an overpriced, unsweetened iced tea asks where we're from. She's friendly in the New Yorker who has time kind of way. She says, yeah, the area is changing. Construction's popped up all around. But she doesn't seem too attached to the way it was before. And she doesn't make fun when I push around my loose change like a child would push green peas around her plate. Andra says, why are there so many American flags everywhere? I know you're American. You don't have to blare it in my face. <laughs> Mr. Kral says he has Czech ancestry. I call him Mr. King to, to honor the heritage of his last name, and he laughs. He says he's been bartending for about 12 years and has lived 26 in the same rent-controlled apartment overlooking East Houston. Mr. King says, it's changing and it's not going back. Shelley says, New York is more diverse than Berlin, her other second home away from home. She doesn't know where she wants to be, but she isn't going back to live in China. Andra says, why do they put so many sweeteners in coffee? And why is the subway so hot? Why can't they just include the tax and the price? They do that in Czech Republic. Mr. King says they've tried to buy him out, freeze him out, annoy him out, and they've never once said hello to him, those millennials who complain about the music coming from the bars beneath their apartments, attracted to the spirit of the area, and then trying to quench it for the sake of their delicate yuppie ears. <laughs> Shelley says, there's an energy of progress here that you can't find elsewhere. In the US, there's somewhere to move forward versus the glorious history of Europe where everything's already set. Andra says, do you mean to tell me that's apple strudel? <laughs> and why is there so much water in the toilets that you could bath a baby in it? <laughs> poem is a little bit different in tone. It's about the, the village where my boyfriend lives, and of course I spend a lot of time there. 
And here in New York, or where I grew up on Long Island, the village is about 24,000 people in the Czech Republic. It could be anywhere between three people and a thousand. <laughs> Here tape. It's called Borac, 9.05 a.m. Distant mist on hills like a shawl laid by ghostly hands wafts water droplets that layer in the rising heat. You could be above it all if you took a roll in those green hills. Instead, you are a mere mortal on the road. The smell of manure and the dusty flick of horsetails linger heavy in the morning haze while salt and pepper haired pensioners turn their endless time into mown grass. They reap what they've sown. Pollen and seeds float on the air like undreamed dreams. The road continues dryly beyond sight like a thirsty mouth. Liberally coated in the exhaust from passing tailpipes, trucks transporting bread, wood, spare parts. You arrive at the village's one platform just as the train is rumbling around the corner, a just woken stomach. In its wake, the river chases its own ripples, and fresh lilac rings its blooming like a church bell. nowadays. So this one is called In-Flight Entertainment. Titanic plays on two adjacent passenger screens two disparate scenes. On one, the dance. The other, the death. When I was younger, this movie epitomized my every romantic dream. Sydney and I watched it through every day for a year. I had a poster of Leonardo DiCaprio when he was king of the world at the bow, and I would kiss those smooth, ripe, laminated lips against my mirror, hoping no one would see my toes so conspicuously beneath the door. I would write his name in steam on the shower. Leo, my first love, my wet dream, the distress signal exploding white behind his head as he gazed down with sacrificial finality on Rose's lifeboat. No matter how many times I've seen it, I always root for it to end differently. We all do, unless we're masochists, of course, yeah. <laughs> Even seeing it on two simultaneous screens, now they are hopeless new lovers triumphing against class odds. Now she breaks his frozen fingers like a rusty lock. Now I am drowning in this dirty plain air, desperate to be the same eight-year-old idealist who didn't really know what distance was, who stopped the videotape before the iceberg hit. <laughs> one is a little bit futuristic or geared toward the future and it's called Mars in 30, 20, 10, 9, number one. The next planet is the next ambition and even more so if it's red. What color could better capture humanity's ever widening pupil hunting the whites to the last edges of the eye? He has the money for it and the good intentions to back it. He has the air of success to win over our lurking greed. Even his name is Perfume. Elon Musk. He wants to send you there. What could be more generous? The sci-fi stories of your youth warned you of the impending moral consequences, but the children's books you read said, reward kindness. There's so little in this world as it is. People are hard and cruel. Your job is pure drudgery. He wants a better future for mankind, and that's something we can all sign on to. And you want to see it, don't you? This world, cracked and scattered, is done for anyway. Number two. You saw an angel on the road, and you swerved. When you cut the ignition and rushed out, it lay there still in a swoon, looking like a drowned moon on tar. You asked it if there was anything that you could do. It said, to cut your showers to three minutes each and buy less plastic. <laughs> number three. You think of it every once, number three, you think of it once every so often when you look at the beaded angel pendant attached by a thin string to your keys. God's a nice idea, 
and also a scapegoat if we ever run out of those on earth. Number four, why should you do anything unless you want to? After all, you are an adult and you have been waiting your whole life to blame somebody for this moment. <laughs> Wait till you're older, they said. Well, you are older and you never had to learn to cook. The kitchen does it for you. And you carry a tiny cinema around in your pocket, saves money. And now the first colonies on Mars. You'll never have enough hundreds of thousands to get there, but you can watch a live stream on your laptop of spacebar brawls and crater-side sacrifices. They make their own rules there. It takes months to get a message through, at least. You are perhaps too old now anyway, with your own knee-jerk tendencies to violence drying out and crusting away. Crushing your iron tablets into a powder is about as close as you will ever get to Mars. You heard their growing lettuce there. You hope the colonists like salad. Ha! It's, <laughs> it's easy to treat your it's easy to treat your great great grandchildren's future with ambivalence. After all, the sun falls quite friendly on your face, and you have every reason to believe that someone else will take care of everything. <laughs> I spot a yellow version of De, De Beauvoir's The Second Sex, and as I try to rest it free, it crunches, like the magnified sound of a caterpillar munching through leaves. There are some dust on its edges, little wasps of gray cotton candy stuck in the crevices of the shelves, a whole ballerina bun of dust. When was the last time these books were touched by the old owner's hands? How much time is there really in each day to review the communal human think tank in this museum? When we arrived, he was outside, fingers curled around coffee and fork, seeming unperturbed about the infinite amount of work compared to his finite time on this earth. And sure, maybe I'm only anxious about myself, but now he merely hums as he reshelves. I balance my own choice stack on the Tower of Pisa of psychoanalysis. My mom asks if I'm going to take them back with me because we have no more room for alien racks of books in the garage, hesitating indefinitely in their grounded saucers. The owner returns intermittently to offer my mom something, then goes back outside to guard his archive of the human mind, erotic and disgusting at the same time, and how much time could there be in a life for touching books? Simone's words were once young, these yellowed pages once new, his old hands once quicker to categorize. What were the thoughts in his mind when pricing these endless variations on the Kama Sutra? How could he know what's here anymore if this tome on space and time from the 80s is still worth $6.75 when he priced it? Was he thinking of the light years of space yet in his store, of the shrinking marble of Pluto, if the knitting needle-sized holes in the sky are possibly the same as those in the black ink photo? All year, I kept five single sentimental dollars in my wallet, an alien hovering indefinitely over home. My mother informs the owner I'm here from Europe. He asks, going to or coming back from? And she says she's going back. Yes, I've come way back sent my own system shuttling recklessly through space in a winged time machine that restored six hours but took a week for recovery, and I'm recovered at last. Three currencies folded into their leather shelves because I can never let go of the past. Here's my last poem, literally 20 seconds, I timed it. <laughs> On the subway, a flight attendant, stockinged, red lips flat as a smile, crisp white shirt with a silver pin, eyebrows crisply penciled. You are not as happy on the way to the airport, lugging your luggage like the locations you shed, and yet, you are the woman of my dreams, forever maintaining flight. Thank you. <laughs>